Welcome to the Revolution Will Be live stream. This is TK Coleman. I hope everybody is creating a great week and I hope you're finding your own way to stay inspired and to stay healthy. Uh, I am super excited about today's episode. It's time to rewrite the memo. Uh, today's guest is Minda Hartz. One of the things she said that I really, really love is she says, the turning point in my career was when I realized I had the power to write my own narrative. And we're gonna talk about that today, what it means to write your own narrative, how she's doing that in her life and career, and how you can do that in your own life. For those of you who've been tuning in, a couple of weeks ago, we had Chris, Chris Coleman on the show, and he's a children's author. He likes a lot of manga comics. And one of the things he talked about was he would read a lot of these comics and he wouldn't see people of color in the comics. And he decided that he would write his own because he wanted to include himself in the story. So many conversations about inclusion tend to get stereotyped as artificially making people who don't like each other talk to each other, artificially putting people who don't deserve positions of leadership in positions of leadership, artificially giving people, jo people jobs when they haven't shown any kind of qualification for those jobs or potential to, to perform the task. But there's another conversation on inclusion that's happening. And that conversation is about getting rid of the artificial ways that we exclude people who do have the talent, who do have the creativity, who do have the intelligence from having the opportunities that they need to make a difference in the world. And today's guest, Minda Hartz, has been doing a tremendous amount of work towards that end. Her book, The Memo, has been featured on Black Enterprise, The Atlantic, and it has been hailed by many as the leaning in for women of color, which to me means the leaning in that includes everyone. Um, uh, so I'm excited to introduce Minda Hearts and we're gonna talk a little bit about what it means to rewrite the memo and how you can use that to change the narrative in your own life. Minda, thanks for joining the Revolution of One live stream. Happy to be here, thank you. I'm excited to talk to you today. I, I wanna kick things off actually with a video clip um, I've watched several of your interviews and you, you participated in a panel discussion on the Atlantic. And there was a moment where the, the host was asking you a question and I thought your answer was pretty compelling. And I think it'd be a good place to start. So I'm gonna play this clip here. Gender, whatever, they come in and they feel like they have the ability to not only succeed in the role that they're in, but to thrive and to rise and become a really integral part of an organization. Minda, I want you to weigh in on that. Yeah, so last year I started something called the Women of Color Equity Initiative, and it's to put more women of color in leadership roles. Um, and it's important because it's like riding in a car. We might all be at the same company. Look at the company as the car. So we're riding in the car together. and. Some of us might be in the front seat, some might be in the back seat, some of us may even feel like we're in the trunk, right? So yes, we are all in the car and we're driving to the same place, but we're not experiencing that workplace quite the same. And I think that some of the people in the front seat need to get in the, the back seat and get in the trunk and get people out of there and bring folks to the table. That's how we change it. Audre Lorde said, I am deliberate and afraid of nothing. And we have to be deliberate about everything we do in the workplace. Yeah. You had a, a TED talk where you talked about your philosophy of leadership and you said it's not just about dreaming things for yourself. It's about dreaming things for other people. Um, I, I want to hear you expound on that a little bit. What does it mean to dream things for other people? Yeah, TK, thank you for that question. Uh, again, honored to be here with you and Kamau. Uh, you know, it's interesting because you think about all of our ancestors, right? Our elders who came before us and it was their courage, right? Leaving the Jim Crow South, heading up North or to the Midwest or the East uh, or West Coast. And they leaned into that courage and pushed aside their caution because they thought about us, right? They might not have known us by name, but they knew that we would be coming along um, after them. And so they knew that they had to make decisions that would benefit future generations. And that would mean leaning into our courage, right? And so when I spent my time in the workplace, I realized, okay, it's cool to get your seat at the table, but who are you being courageous for? And I had to constantly ask myself that question because depending upon what I do, if I lean into my courage or if I lean into my caution, nobody benefits if I'm cautious. But think about how many people benefit from our courage. And there's a generation of women of color 
people of color that are that were waiting on me to activate my voice, right? So that they could benefit from a workplace being better than I found it. And so that's what I'm saying. Like the things that we get to do, we have the privilege. Generosity is a privilege. And we get to benefit, we get to be, um, someone gets to inherit our courage. And I feel like that's a super dope concept. <laughs> yeah, I agree. You know, so much talk on success revolves around the importance of setting boundaries, being able to say no, being a little selfish. And there are a lot of people who they kind of run themselves into the ground because all they do is they think about other people. They're, they're constantly trying to help somebody else out, pull somebody else up, and they never realize their own potential. How do we find that balance? Because clearly we need that message of having a purpose that's bigger than your own immediate gratification. And at the same time, we need some kind of way of putting ourselves in a position where we actually can make a difference. How do you find that? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a dance, you know, because especially right now, I mean, you could, I think many of us are probably working from the moment we get up till the, you know, till we get in the bed, even in the bed, we have our devices trying to put that last email out. But it's, it's a, it's a struggle, right? Um, but the other thing that I also realize is that um, it's that self-advocacy. And I talk a lot about self-advocacy because I find that it's revolutionary. It's one of our greatest acts of self-love. So if I'm able to advocate for myself when it's good, when it's bad, you know, when I'm uncertain about things, then I'm able to then also advocate for others. But I think we have to take care of ourselves, understanding what, what our needs are, but then also uh, leveraging our opportunities to help other people. And I think once we find that balance, but it's hard to advocate for others uh, and survive if you're, or, or thrive if you're not advocating for yourself. So I think it's important that we strike that balance um, because we wanna be beneficiaries of our courage too. Yeah. Yes. You're hitting on so many great points. Um, one of the things as, as a young person, I wanted to kind of pick your brain on is I think a lot of people step into, you know, step into their courage kind of after the fact that they know their talents or they know what they're good at um, or, or they're getting some kind of confirmation, right? How, how did you make that transition um, to, to kind of stepping into this person that you are today? Like how old were you when you recognized or you saw yourself as, hey, I, I can be a leader. I, I, can, I can show people the way. I'm still, if I'm being honest, I'm still learning who that person is. Uh, you know, I wish I could say I'm like Beyonce and I woke up this way, but it took small acts of courage to even get to the point that I am now. And, and it's a journey. But what I will say is uh, it happened. I, I always remember it as if it were yesterday happening to me because I was actually in the workplace and I was struggling in terms of just dealing with racism and microaggressions, the whole nine. And I had built this really what I felt was a successful career and it was being choked out by systemic racism. And I just remember being in my car after a really tough meeting about some things that had happened. And I literally was telling myself on the way to the car, okay, Minda, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry. And I get to my car and in all full transparency, I cry because I just was at my wits mm. end and I thought, what am I going to do, you know? And I turn on the radio and I find that God has a really funny sense of humor. I turn on the radio and Whitney Houston's Where Do Broken Hearts Go? And I thought in that moment, where do the broken hearts go of women of color when we can't take it anymore? And it was in that car. I didn't know what it looked like. I didn't know it looked like a book and a company, but I knew I had to do something. And that was where I started to allow my curiosity to be larger than my fear. What would it look like? if I went down this path. And so it was a journey uh, that was in 2014. Things didn't manifest itself till much later, but I just knew I had to do something. And I think if we listen to our gut, knowing that, you know, again, we have two choices to be courageous or cautious. And I decided, you know what, I've been cautious long enough. Hmm. You know, I, I think there's a couple different variations of uh, being courageous. Like it, it, it's a unique thing to each individual. And I think a lot of people, you know, when when they kind of are presented with the problem that you're trying to solve, I think there's the avenue of creating your own lane. And then there's the avenue of maybe infiltrating um, an organization and getting to those higher ranks where you have a little bit more credibility and a little bit more authority where you can bring people in. Um, so as you were making this decision, as you were um, evolving into the person you are now, 
how did you evaluate each of those? You know, the creed in the own lane versus staying put and, and rising in the ranks. Okay. I, I It's interesting because I think it was trial and error uh, because what I was attempting to, I guess, lean into, if you will, is this conversation around women in the workplace and realizing that when we say women in the workplace, we don't necessarily mean women that look like me. And so I did initially, I didn't think that I was the one to like lead this or talk about this. And I approached some of those career development companies who were saying that all women have a seat at the table. And I wanted to work with them and partner with them because I thought that, you know, they were in this space, they were thought leaders, they had that cloud, if you will, and they did not want to talk about the intersectionality. And so um, I just decided, well, you know, who's going to advocate on our behalf? And so little by little, I'll just start to figure out what this looks like. And, and that's what I did. And, and I'm so glad I did because um, we wouldn't be having some of the hard conversations um, that we're having today. You know, Minda, it's easy to dismiss problems and, and challenges when you when you don't identify with it when, when you look at it and say oh that's not about me that's that's y'all problem that's that's their problem i'm curious to know when you're having these conversations what are some of the challenges you face along those lines what are some of the objections that are made things that are said or difficulties encountered uh when you try to shift the narrative and, and talk about you know having a seat at the mm -hmm. table <laughs> Yeah, the thing that I've learned is that people love status quo, right? So when you come in saying, "Hey, I want to, sh I want to shake this room up a little bit," you know, people are uncomfortable with, with that. They're like, "What is she doing?" You know, why, why is she here? And even you know, I would ask myself, well, "What am I doing? Why, why am I shaking this table?" But um, <laughs> I, I had spent almost 15 years of my career being almost invisible, right? People dismissing my thoughts, people you know, not advancing me, knowing that I was one of the top people on the team, you know, when you look at the statistics and the data. And I just was like, you know what? Um, I know this as lived experience as being one of the only ones in the room and primarily all the time. And so I had to, as you say, rewrite the story. I had to redefine who I am and who I want to be in the workplace. And I can no longer, you know, James Baldwin talked about um, believing the lie. America has created this lie that they like for us to believe. And that would be that you should just be happy and grateful for whatever you get inside the workplace. And so I realized that um, I wasn't I wasn't okay with the status quo anymore. And I don't care what anybody was telling me, you know, it's not going to be solved by working any harder. I think we, we know that mm. we're some of the hardest working people on the planet, right? So we're going to have to find another way to have this conversation. And I wasn't, I wasn't willing to stop. Right. And that's part of that courageous piece. Even when people don't see the vision, do you have the stamina to see it to completion? And, and that's what I just kept doing. And I knew in my, former career, how it felt. But then when I went on to talk to people who were in the space, I was met with that again. And I thought, you know what, there's something that they don't want us to unleash. They don't want us to activate our voice. They don't want us to see that we have a rightful place at this table or to create our own. And so a long story short, I just started to believe my own story, which was writing the narrative that uh, we deserve to be in any room we walk into, but not every room deserves to have us. And once we understand that, then we don't have to listen to uh, the naysayers or the haters. You're making this a very difficult interview because everything you say, I have like five or six different <laughs> questions I want to ask. <laughs> but but you're making it difficult for all, for all the right reasons. For all the right reasons, it's, it's a good way to make it difficult. I, I, I love that last statement. You said we deserve to be in every room that we walk into, but every room doesn't deserve to have us. I want to hear more about that. Yeah, you know, I at first I I'll make it personal. I think for a lot of my career, I just wanted I wanted to belong, right? I wanted the table to see me. I wanted them to see me as an asset, not a diversity hire. You know, all of the things that um, systemic racism, but also imposter syndrome, might try to tell us. And after a while, I just started to realize that I'm tired of trying to convince anyone that I'm talented. Right. That I mean, you know, run the numbers, <laughs> you know, like I, I worked really hard to get here. And so I'm done convincing people of that. And so I have to know that about myself. Uh, when I was growing up, my mom would always tell me and my brothers, as long as you know. 
And I had to go back to those wise words that she used to quote to us, as long as we know. Uh, we've embedded ourselves in some of these workplace cultures and cultures in general, where they would try to tell us that we're less than, or we don't, you know, they're lowering the bar if we're in the room. And, you know, that's false. And so for me, it's I'm being more selective on the rooms and the tables that I choose to sit at. Not any, I'm not going to plant myself where I can't grow anymore, but it took a while for me to understand that. Mm. Yeah. You know, I feel like that's a, there's something about that philosophy that when we hear it, we know that that's the right way to think. We, yeah. we know that's how we all should be. It's kind of like, it's kind of like, you know, when you're younger and somebody gives you dating advice and they say, hey, man, like, you know, th there are plenty of opportunities. And if someone doesn't like you, just let them go. It's like, you know, that's the right way to do it. But that's really, really hard. Right. And, and I feel like for many young people, when, when they're just starting out in their careers, there's a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure to code switch, a lot of pressure to pretend to be something they are not in order to, you know, in order to move up the ranks or just put up with things that they don't like in order to keep their job because they don't have a sense of abundance yet. They don't really know what their value is. Yeah. How, how do you adopt that mentality early on before you've gotten to that point where you say, hey, I got five options if y'all don't want me in this room? Yeah, I think it's having conversations like this because I'll be honest, had I been exposed to conversations like we're having today, I would have understood my worth before I even entered corporate America. Right. So I think it does start because a lot of the things, the signals that we get as young kids of color, it stems from our childhood, you know, the maybe the high schools you went to, the junior highs that, you know, so having those hard conversations, like I remember uh, being one of few in my high school, um, black people, and, you know, there were so many things going on. And at a young age, I was shown that, you know, there is a hierarchy, there is a caste system when it comes to race in these environments. And so when you, when you are, um, shown those narratives or told those narratives, those are the type of narratives that you then take along with you as you become an adult, right? So I think if we talk about our worth, um, Audre Lord, she says, beware of feeling like you're not good enough to deserve it. And I think once we understand that early on, we'll know, okay, I'm actually interviewing my potential job too, right? It's not just, I'm happy to yeah. be here, but yeah. are they meeting my expectations too? But we don't know that that stuff sometimes. So I, I do think that um, more of our young adults will be more equipped than some of us because they will be exposed to some of these conversations much earlier than maybe we had been. Yeah. You know, Minda, you, you talked about shaking the table. And I think, like you said, sometimes you're not even sure why you're shaking the table, right? Sometimes you're just following some intuition, some greater calling that you know you're supposed to do this, but it's not as easy to explain it. It's not as easy to rationalize it to not only the people who were already sitting at the table, but maybe some colleagues or friends of yours who were like, hey, Minda, like you're doing something kind of dangerous here, right? You're you're really rattling the room. So what what are what have those conversations been like? You know, people who uh, normally support you, right? They could be parents, they could be friends, um, but but people who who want to see the best for you and and don't want to see you in dangerous situations, who who don't want to see you, you know, taking these big risks. How have you been able to find the courage to? you know, to, to kind of express to them that what you're doing is right and and to find the courage within to be able to continue to move forward and continue to do the work despite having, um, despite, you know, the fear and despite every everybody else kind of feeling fearful for you. Yeah, I appreciate that question. And, uh, you know, as you were asking it, I was ref reflecting because, you know, some people may see where we're at right now, but they don't know <laughs> what it took uh, the crawling, the the crying to get to to this point, right? The really the heavy shaking, um, and hoping that people will will feel it. And for me, it really was just honoring what I felt God was placing in in my heart and in my spirit uh, to figure out. I didn't know what it looked like always, but I knew that 
this would benefit not just myself, but others and future generations to come. And that was my guiding light. So even when I started, before I wrote my book, I had a com I have a company called The Memo and that came first. And even when I was talking about, okay, well, yeah, women in the workplace is important, but what about women of color? Because one in 25 women of color get advanced to the C-suite, whereas one in five, so not all women are experiencing the workplace the same. Like people didn't wanna hear those numbers and hear those facts. And even though they didn't wanna hear it, it didn't make it any less true, right? And so I wasn't just leading these conversations with just my feelings uh, and my lived experiences, which are important, but also facts and statistics to, to help guide those. And so I just knew, knew that there were, I was meeting too many other black women, women of color that were experiencing the same things. And I knew I had to keep going regardless of what people say. And even to your point with family and friends, there were some that when I did leave corporate America, I didn't tell them because I part of part of the courage is having boundaries, right? Because I know what I'm doing and I don't need you to um, muddy my vision, right? Muddy the waters. I need to be have open mind and heart to hear what I'm supposed to do next. And so I kept some things close to the vest because I didn't need that extra. It's already hard shaking the room, right? And then you don't need people who are questioning why you're doing this. If they don't understand it, then maybe in time they will, but I can't be focused on that. There's too much more work to be done. And so it really was a mindset shift. I, you know, I live in New York City, so I had to embody that New York state of mind versus enemy state of mind. And that was the thing that kept my foot on the gas. You said something um, a bit earlier, too, that that resonated with me, you were actually talking about a tweet that I think we're going to get into in a bit. But um, you said you, you wanted to tweet it because you felt that someone else may be feeling this. How much has that principle guided you along your journey that that there might be someone else out there who's feeling this too yeah pretty much i would say almost everything i do uh at least in my current life is i often think well maybe someone else is experiencing this too and i know how it i know when i was in my former life and even today sometimes you feel like you're isolated right you're the only one experiencing these things and because we sometimes don't talk about them out loud uh, we go down our own rabbit hole and uh, we just get further and further down there. And sometimes it's just nice to say, you know, uh, like we say online, I don't know who needs to hear it. And sometimes it's just for us, but somebody else might need to hear it too. And so who could benefit? Uh, and even if one person benefits and just says, you know what, I feel that I resonate with that, um, then it creates a larger conversation. And I think that's how you build community. You know, Minda, I I'm of the persuasion that, um, we should read books not just because we think they are about us, but we should read books because they inform us about things in the world that affect us, that um, that make a difference, even if we don't, you know, necessarily identify with it. So I know the memo you you wrote that with women of color in mind. I love for you to talk to the men that are listening right now and uh, give a word to the men for why we should take the time to read this book, why we should not just say, oh, that's that's their conversation. Yeah, and uh, that's a great question because our unconscious bias would say that's for y'all, right? That, that's for them, but we all work together, right? And if you see yourself as an ally or someone who's invested in the success of women of color in the workplace, wouldn't you wanna know what their experience is like, how you might be able to help them? Uh, and I think it's under, to your point, we have to read the experiences of others so that we know how to potentially show up for them, you know, because what I might be experiencing is something that you may not ever have to experience. But if you see it going down, you're like, oh, that's what Minda was talking about when she mentioned X or whomever book you're reading. And so I think it's so important. And I do it for myself, you know, for groups that I may not identify with. I read about, though, I read history because I understand that um, there's ways for me to show up without um, burdening someone I could potentially help. Right. So I think we have a we're in a unique position where we can listen we can ex educate and we can activate all on our own right so um the last thing i'll say about that is when we were able to go out and do speaking engagements in person i was at a, a certain company and at the end of the event i had um an african-american man approach me at the very end and he said you know i'm so glad i came to hear you speak because i look i thought about some of the stories you told and i I'm going to have to apologize to the other women of color on my team because I have not mm -hmm. shown up for them in the ways that they've needed mm -hmm. me to. And now I know I need to do better. 
And those are the type of conversations. That's when the real magic happens, right? When we see there's room and opportunities for us to activate and be better to each other. I love that. One of the easiest ways to dismiss an idea is by creating a straw man version of that idea and knocking it down. This happens all the time with discussions on inclusion. And uh, an example of that would be taking ideas like what you talk about in the memo and equating it with something like, oh, so I'm just supposed to sit around feeling guilty all day about how evil men are. Or, or something like, oh, okay, so even if a woman is unqualified, no one on the team likes this woman, this woman is rude to my customers, I'm just supposed to put this person in a position of leadership. We know that's not the message. I would love for you to state what is the actual message of the memo and what does it really mean to be an ally? Like, let's let's blow through the stereotypes. Yeah, I think that, <laughs> so let's humanize it, right? If you work in an environment um, when you want, or you're a manager, let's say you're a manager or you're, you're a colleague, wouldn't you want everyone on your team or in your department to thrive in the workplace and not just survive? Or wouldn't you, if you, if you hired a team of people to do a job, don't you want 100% of, of their talent and not just 50%? And so if you, when, when people, when employees are happy, when everyone is happy, then that produces productivity. And when productivity is good, that means business is good, right? So it's imperative. I think it's business imperative that people are enjoying the work that they do and, and feeling as though people are invested in their success. Why isn't everyone in the workplace feeling as though their their success matters, right? And that's why this is what this conversation is about, right? There's room for all of us to have opportunities, but not all of us have access to that opportunity. So how do we dismantle a system that doesn't allow everyone to have a bite at the apple, right, necessarily? And so I think it's important that we have these conversations because um, part of allyship uh, is the active. It, it has to be an action. You know, for many people, when you were younger, you might have done Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts or Cub Scouts or something like that. And in order to get the badge, you had to do the act, right? It's an action. You don't just get it just because you actually had to do something to activate that. And that's what allyship is. It has to be active. And if you have never been uncomfortable or you've never activated your allyship, then you probably are doing allyship wrong because allyship will require something of you. Um, and the last thing that I'll say is when I was in corporate America, I had a manager and really fast, he, he, I had burnt orange fingernail polish on and he said, you people love your bright colors. And he joked around for 15 minutes about how black people like bright colors. I'm the only black woman in the room. And I had other colleagues there that said nothing, right? Are they good people? Um, perhaps, <laughs> right? But two things can be true at the same time. I can be experiencing this workplace on, a, on a, uh, the pits of hell, right? And my other colleagues can be thriving and surviving, <laughs> thriving in the workplace. And I think it's so important. How much, how important would that have been in a moment in my career and to my manager had my colleague activated his allyship in that moment? I would have seen myself in a different way and how I carried myself as a woman in the workplace. And it also went a signal to my boss that it's not okay to say those sorts of things. And so I, we talked about courage at the top of the hour, who are you willing to be courageous for? And that's where allyship is, is meant to work. And that's why we all need the memo. That is such a beautiful illustration and story. Um, I think one that a lot of us can relate to, right? Um, feeling like, something just got said and you're kind of looking around to see if anybody else heard it. Like, did, I know you guys heard that. Um, <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's, that's so true. And, and, you know, it, it kind of leads into my question. How, I think a part of what I'm looking to hear is how you carried yourself in the workplace. I think you're, you're very strong. You have a strong personality. Um, you seem like a natural born leader. And I think a lot of times people in the workplace can get intimidated by that kind of energy, um, can feel, you know, can, can, can suggest that you're being combative, can feel threatened by, you know, you being strong. And then and, uh, the other part I kind of want to know is, is how do you recommend for people who might be um, the only one in the room, how do you recommend that they carry that energy? Um, 
yeah, just just what what was your experience like trying to navigate the corporate world and 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 how you showed up? Yeah, well, if I'm being honest, um, again, it took a while for me to find my voice, and so I was one of those you know first generation college students, first person in my family to enter into corporate America, so. When I entered, the advice that I received, like many of us, is just work hard and keep your head down and the good things will come. And that's exactly what I did for many, many years, right? I'm just, let's work hard and nobody's working harder than me. And um, I did experience some success, but when I looked up after I, my head had been down, I looked up and I said, all of these people around me are getting opportunities, not because they're working harder than me. So what is that about, right? What is it? it it's not after we question ourselves, like, what could I be doing more? You realize that there's a system at play. And for me, that's when I started to say, oh, okay, what do I need to do to make sure that I am, hmm. I am activating myself in the ways that need to need to be right. So I wasn't that person that would ask for the stretch assignments. I wasn't pushing back when my manager talked about black people loving bright colors for 15 minutes. That wasn't me because I didn't think I could. I didn't think I had the agency to be able to show up like that. I should just be shut up and be happy that I have this good paying job, right? That's the energy I was bringing to the workplace because that's the energy I thought I had to have. Um, and people often ask me, how did you find your voice? And I realized that I always had it. I just had to figure out how I wanted to use it. And once I realized that I have the, again, the ability to create and write my own narrative, then I can create boundaries. I can say, if those things bother me, then I can, you know, tell me more about that. I can ask those questions, right? In a way that um, centers the truth and, and the facts of how I experienced it. And so it was, it was those small acts of courage, Kamal, that got me to that, to that place. And, and I, and it's not prescriptive, right? Uh, I was even the type of person was deathly afraid to speak up at all. And so I realized that in order to change the narrative, I have to lean into my voice. And I started to take public speaking lessons. I started to do improv classes like those. That's how I found my strength. That's how I found my energy. Things that people tried to silence us generations. I it was like, wait a second, I have a choice in this. I can write this story the way I want to, but it's going to require something of me. And that's what I did. And so I'm continuously doing that, but not without uh, that continuous courage. And so if for those who are trying to find their voice, you have it, you just have to figure out how you want to use it. And it may be boisterous, it may be uh, influencing people behind the scenes, like there's no roadmap to this, but you have to decide what it looks like for you. And that's what I think about career development, um, self improvement is what it looks like for you. And so give yourself permission to identify what what that route is for you. And, and for me, again, it just was, I was literally, as Lauren Hill said, it, it, the environment was killing me softly. And I realized if I didn't do something about this, then it's going to be, some of that is on me, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I, I really can resonate with, with, you know, feeling like I just need to work hard, right? Feeling like I just need to put my head down and I'll let my results speak for myself. And I think, a lot of people who may enter a workplace or who just may enter any kind of organization or entity and um, not not be not being in a leadership position or not having a lot of authority, you know, again, we're just trained to, to put our head downs and to create or to put our head downs and to do what are told. And so it's really interesting hearing you transition into, you know, this this great leader, this um, this outspoken person. And, and I a hundred percent agree with you that all of us have it in us, but I, what I know to be true is, is if you kind of come from a place where you're quieter, where you're more intimidated, where you're more obedient and you're transitioning into a place of authority, I think even, even though you're leaning into your truth, you're still going to question whether this is the right decision or this is the right way, or am I, is my message being delivered in the most, you know, uh, compelling way possible? Like, is are these people receiving what I'm saying? And so you, you mentioned imposter syndrome, and you mentioned that that was something that you faced. And I'm, I'm sure that there are times when you know, you break through a new paradigm, or you're, you're sitting on stage, and you feel it again, like, how, how, how am I the leader for this? And so I, I'd like to hear you just just explain 
how, how you deal with imposter syndrome? Like, how has that shown up for you? Yeah, uh, it's a, if I'm being honest, it's an everyday battle, sometimes hour by hour, um, because for so long, I was living my life in a place of deficit and not the abundance, right? Understanding that, oh, well, um, society has looked at me this way. We have to work 10 times harder, you know, just going with that mindset. And so for me, uh, the environments in which I worked in, it was always with the, the top 1% wealthy individuals and so i would go into these environments coming from you know very humble beginnings and always feeling like i didn't belong you know and i you know and, and if i'm being honest again i there's times even in my life right now where i i still see myself you know you might see me as a strong woman right now but there are times when i see myself as the girl with the book of food stamps that would pay you know for my groceries when my parents would send me in the store you know that's the person that i still see sometimes and i have to battle that each and every day and it's in and it's telling myself a new story about myself every day a one of belonging right regardless of if somebody sees me in that room or not do i see myself and i constantly do that internal work because you can't win if you ain't right within right so i know that every day i have to kill that monster because that monster can't go where i'm headed and that will smother us right some of us never get to our destiny because we allow our inner thoughts to snuff us out before we get there and i will fight every day of my life to push that back because i know what's inside of me i know what i've been created to do right and so again it's telling ourselves that new story so if you're watching today and you're battling that um know that you are more than a conqueror and you can you can speak to that thing and eventually the more you keep doing that you become bigger than that and i mentioned earlier um, let your curiosity be larger than your fear. I have those fears still. I have some of that, but I know back to the curse thing, who benefits if I'm cautious? If I don't get on that stage, if I don't take that opportunity, then somebody that was meant to hear it won't get to hear it, right? And I don't get to release that and lean closer into what I was created to do. And so I just remind myself that it's it's bigger than me. It's bigger than this feeling and I'm going to get on this, get on the other side of it. But, it, you know, some of us will always, you know, you talk about healing, right? Healing is important. And some of us and myself, it's part of the healing journey for me to continuously talk about some of those things because I'm not perfect, right? There's things that still get in my way, but I know uh, what I've been created to do. And, and once we kind of own that, even if we don't know what it looks like or it might come later in the day, but understanding, okay, I, I identify what's trying to happen here and you can't go with me. So we're just smushing that down, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's talk to the hand because we can't. It, I just don't have time for it. <laughs> you know? Minda, one thing I'm really grateful for is just the honesty uh, with which you answered Kamal's question about um, showing up strong. You know, how you talked about that moment at work where the boss made that joke and went on for 15 minutes. In that moment, you didn't speak up. You didn't take a stand and, and, and you chose to be silent. And I think there are so many people out there who make this an either or kind of thing. Like if you have one moment in your life where you could have shown up strong and you didn't, well, you've sold out and you're done. Yeah. And there are so many people that never come back from that kind of moment. And what your story illustrates for me is that we all have at least one moment in life where we could have shown up strong for ourselves and others. And because we just couldn't think fast enough or because we were just afraid or whatever it was, we didn't react. And later on, we looked back and said, man, I wish I would have said something. But those moments, they too are a part of the story. And we can learn from those moments. We can bounce back from those moments and they become part of that encouraging testimony that helps other people overcome their moments. So I thank you for not only talking about how you use your voice, but also being transparent about the moments where, where you did it and how you learned from that. So this leads me to my next question. Oh, sorry, go ahead, please. I just want to say, I think it's an important point you made because there will be those moments. We're going to have those moments, right? That, And we can't live in those moments and know that, okay, what does it look like when the moment happens again? And I think that's where, that's where the sweetness is. Yeah. When we talk about courage and using your voice, I find that there are, uh, there are usually two aspects to this. One is kind of knowing what your rights are knowing that you have the right to say no to certain things, knowing that you have the right to make certain demands of others and so forth. And 
there, there are some people where you tell them like, hey, if, if you don't feel comfortable with that, like you have the right to make that no. And it's like, whoa, the light turns on. I have that right. But there's this second dimension too, where even when you know what your rights are, sometimes it's, it's hard to be courageous when you don't have a way of saying it that feels natural. And, and for a lot of people that are just beginning to assert themselves, speaking up feels so dramatic. Like, how do you say, hey, that's not acceptable? Or, hey, I would actually prefer this. I'm curious if you have um, any insight on what to say when you don't know how to put it, how to stand up for yourself, how to ask for what you need, how to put yourself at the table when the words are eluding you. Yeah, uh, because it's different. It's different from the theory and the practice, right? So we can, when it's happening to us <laughs> is one thing, but yeah, we can read 10 steps on how to do it. But when it's happening is a different story. Uh, it's one of the reasons why, um, so the hardcover of my book and audio came out a year ago, but a couple weeks ago, the paperback version of the memo came out and I had an opportunity to add another chapter in that book. And that's the one thing that I said to my editor. I said, you know what, I want to add like a script section because what I feel is missing from the first version is what happens when like what are the, what's the language you know I can't I may not be able to give you you know all the sentences all the words but here here's some language and you make it your own right here's what happens when and I think those are the moments right we just sometimes need um, a script some words just to say okay if this happens then here's what it is and I think that's important and I think the other part of that is um building a squad of people in which you can be vulnerable with, vulnerable with and have these conversations and if need be role play right i know it sounds odd but because we're not used to always having these sorts of conversations what would it look like if tom said this or kim said this or you know be it good or bad how would you respond to that and i think we do have to arm ourselves with that type of language because when we don't have the language, then we go back to our seats or couch and we play it on a reel, right? And we beat ourselves up to your point of why didn't I say that in the moment, right? And I think um, if we have, you know, some things in our toolkit that help us get through those moments each and every time, then um, I think we'll also establish, help us establish boundaries because I think about my career and I think of all the things that people said to me, there must have been some reason why they thought they could continuously say those things to me right? because they felt there was no boundary set. And I realized if I wanted to change this narrative, there's something that I'm going to have to do to change this situation. <laughs> and it's not hollering at them. You know, that's, that's not my vibe. Now it might be somebody else's, but it's like, okay, what am I going to say to let them know that this is not okay? And then I'd be okay with that and not then be worried about how, how it landed on them. And I think there's so much psychology to having those courageous conversations. Yeah. You know, one thing I just want to throw in there too is that these conversations, um, some people, when they listen, they think it's only about the negative. They think it's only about telling someone when something is unacceptable, but it's mm -hmm. also about the positive. You know, Definitely. no one is ever going to think about your needs as much as you're going to think about them. That's that's a sad reality, right? That, that if, if you need something in order to be happy, in order to be set up for success, you have to develop that skill of identifying that need, translating that into a request, and then making it known. And sometimes being prepared to sell people on why that's a win for them, you know? Yeah. Um, and there, there's a positive, constructive dimension to standing up for yourself. It's not, you know, a lot of people are, are afraid of just kind of like being combative all the time, but it's not just about that. It's about, it's about being creative as well. Yeah, I, I wholly, I solely, wholeheartedly agree with that because when I look back at, at in my former career, it was very rare that I think anybody who worked with me would say I was combative, you know. And I think there's a way to finesse these conversations, and that's and that's the part where you learn to influence uh, people who you're talking to, and you're building uh, your social capital inside the workplace, so that when these situations happen, you're not the only one fighting, but you have others who can also be there to say your name in the room. Um, and then the other part of self-advocacy is knowing when to say what you need, right? Like right now, a lot of companies are t saying, asking us, what what does good look like? What do you need right now? And we can't just say nothing, no, nothing. I don't need anything. Yeah. Tell them what you need. <laughs> you know, even yeah. that part of it, when people ask you what you need, 
practicing how to articulate that because those are some of those missed opportunities as well. You know, it's really interesting to hear you talk about social capital because it seems to be a theme on our show where yeah. where people kind of bring up the importance and I'd love to kind of hear you you talk a little bit more about the importance of show, social capital. You know, you talked about um, investing in people, you talked about companies investing in people, but I think, you know, as an individual inside of a company, why is it important to invest in the people around you? Yeah, it's so important uh, because, you know, I, to the point that I made earlier where, <laughs> when I was at, in my former life and I was working really hard, coming in early, staying in late, head down, right? Like head down, you, you could see the top of my head really, really good. <laughs> but what I realized was that nobody was really knowing that I was doing all this hard work, right? Yes, they seen me coming in early and those sorts of things, but I needed to get FaceTime with people, right? I needed to um, advocate for myself, be at some of those happy hours, be at the workplace birthday parties that I don't really want to be at. You know, I had to be seen in those places and I need to strategically have conversations with people that are at the table that I'm not at yet, right? And so when I did start to understand those dynamics of social capital, that if somebody vouches for you because they feel like they know you, that could catapult your career 10x. You know, I, I might've been sitting there working um, six more years before I got to the table. But when I started to work the room, right? As I say, even in a virtual environment, you can still work the room. When you when I realized that that was part of the, the ingredients as well, I made connections with two men in my life, Chuck and Steve, who happen to be two white men, get you a Chuck, uh, get you a Steve. And, you know, they come in different different sizes. But the, real, the, the issue was that I wasn't in the rooms that Chuck and Steve were. And because they had relationship with me, because they were invested in my success, because I put myself out there to, ha to make that happen, they then vouched for me and they exponentially helped me build a career that I had already been laying the foundation for. But because they put their stamp of approval in a room that was not paying attention to me, that was their, they use their social capital to catapult me and they, and we both benefit from it. So I do believe that success is not a solo sport. We need people in our lives that can invest in us and vice versa. Hmm. You know, I, I have a follow up question. You know, I think for people who might view this as well, I don't, I'm not going to suck up to anybody or I'm not going to sell out to anybody. How, you know, how do you kind of explain, um, the value of relationships to a person that that doesn't want to suck up or that doesn't want to, you know, kiss butt. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, that's real. That's real. But I, I think that we're looking at it the wrong way. This is strategy, right? What is the strategy that we need to um, incorporate in our life to get to the place we want to be. And I think that's with anything, right? If you are in a dating relationship, there's a certain strategy that you might in, implore to make sure that you get to the aisle, right? <laughs> or you, or, you know, or you buy that house, like it's no different, right? There's certain resources and tools that we need in life that just enhance life. And some of those people have access to the things we might need. And I think you have to understand where your boundaries are, right? So I'm not saying that you get out of pocket and you do all these things, do things that are authentic to you, right? Anything that I connected with Steve or Chuck were, were not out of my personality, right? You know, yes, I might have pushed myself to one or two extra happy hours that I didn't want to go to, but I could still look at myself in the mirror and have no qualms about going to those places, right? So I think you have to uh, figure out what that looks like for you and realize that there may be people that you need to connect with to help you get there a little bit quicker, a little more efficiently. And I think if we look at it differently, not like, oh, I'm not going to, I'm not a sellout or blah, blah, blah. When you look at it that way, then, you know, you're already blocking some of your blessing because that's not what it's about. It's about the strategy behind it, not just going to happy hour just to say you went, but who saw you there? Who did you talk to? When you talk to them, what did you talk about? You know, so realizing that it's all part of the plan. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I, I know, you know, some of the most successful sales guys that I know are, are relational people. It's it's not just about a transactional experience with a customer, but they'll ask, you know, they'll ask things outside of the normal business context, right? To build those relationships. They'll, they'll make those touches. They'll make those rounds. Um, 
they'll they'll ask about the family like all of that plays into how people treat you you know it we're 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 people even though we might show up in a workplace as an asset or as a worker like we're, we're people and people all of us have things that we can relate on all of us have things that we can connect on and i think you know to ignore that like you said it, it it's just an extension of you blocking your blessing like there there is potential there. And, and I think it really is about framing and, you know, allowing yourself to, to lean into that. I have one last question for you. Um, you know, you talked about the importance of investing in people. We just talked about all the social capital, but you also said something that was really interesting about how, how what this journey to become the leader you are right now, what it's looked like how, and, 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 the ways in which you've invested in yourself. And so I'd kind of like to hear you to shine a little bit more light for, you know, people who may be, um, you know, five, 10 years prior in their journey. And like, how did you invest in yourself? Um, and how has that helped you get where you are right now? Oh, yeah. Uh, investing in myself has been, has never been a regret, <laughs> never been a regret of mine, because nobody's going to invest in me the way that I can. Um, and so for me, uh, I mentioned to you that I had invested in some public speaking courses. Now I invested in those courses 10 plus years ago. Um, and I would continuously take them in various forms and, and I didn't even have a seat yet, but I realized that the people who had a seat, they were using their voice. And I'm like, that's something I need to figure out how to, how to work on. Right. So I looked at the skills that I had and I said, well, how can I round my leadership skills out a little bit more, you know, and uh, another ways I did that was reading leadership books. Um, okay, I want to be at the table. What's it look like to be a good manager? You know, what's it look like to get the most out of your entire team? I was doing a lot of things and investing in myself, preparing for my next. And so even though I wasn't there yet, I was preparing for when that next opportunity, my next role would be. And I would get those tools and look, I'd look at um, job descriptions. What are the things, the competencies that they're looking for in a position five to 10 years ahead? Am I doing those things to get me there? And I was really intentional about my steps. And so for me, again, public speaking was at the top of that list for me. And it, if you would have told me that 10 years later, 2020, 2019, that I would be named one of the uh, top 40 women speakers in 2020 by um, a, a public speaking magazine, I would have laughed in your face because I never saw myself that way, right? But it was the early investment that got me to this point today. And sometimes we invest in ourselves and we don't know why, but we know it's a tool we might need later in our life. So again, I, it's never a regret of mine to invest in myself. And I still use coaches today. I, I, you know, there's a lot of things because I don't believe we just arrive and then we stop learning. There's always uh, iterations of ourselves to continuously get better. Minda, one, one part of your journey that you mentioned earlier is how you had to go from knowing how much value you were creating for your company to actually, uh, actually having that value acknowledged. And I find that that can be a very challenging thing. Like it's one thing to have value. It's another thing to signal to other people that you have it. Like it's possible to be the person in an organization that knows a whole bunch about something, but nobody even knows. So how do you signal your value to others without being obnoxious about it? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, so it's back to the strategy. Right. And I think um, we've been talking a lot about it, but it's the human humanization of each other. It's the relationship building. Right. So I have to let people in a little if I want to get a little from people, too. And so for me, I in my former life, I wasn't as vulnerable as I am now um, because mm -hmm. I think when we kind of hide certain parts of ourselves. Then we're not able to be free either. And I realized that there's a bunch of stories and experiences that I have to share because it's going to help somebody else's journey cry maybe less tears than maybe I shed. And so for me, it's uh, one of those things where now I'm like, now I lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm like, okay. I was going down uh, uh, down a road and I'm like, wait a second. I don't think I'm answering what, what he originally asked of me. I'm sorry. Can you ask me again? <laughs> that was a great foundation. How, how do we, how do we show other people our value without sounding yes. like arrogant, obnoxious? Yes. Uh, so I think that it's part of the 
the relationship building, right? Allowing people in um, and building that foundation of being consistent. And so when I started my journey, I started with uh, some people don't know is I started writing uh, what we call a blog in 2015. And every Monday I put out this career blog and that was writing about some of the things that I was experiencing mm -hmm. and letting people in slowly, slowly, slowly. Right. And so the things that I had been talking about in 2015 are many of the same things I'm talking about in 2020, right. Just enhanced and um, into a larger audience. So I think it's, important to um just continue to be authentically you and i think that's part of it right you know i am unapologetic about my pursuit to making sure the workplace is better than i found it for women of color and i've always been i've always leaned into that and my big brother stephen hart who was on the show not too long ago he always reminds me he's like that's the piece that people like minda make sure you never you hold tight to that you know i love grits and rap lyrics and typically when i'm speaking i'll drop you know, a Drake line or a JV, like I can't help it, you know, and those are the things where I feel like when you're authentic, then people, you know, you always have some people who might question that, but the people who know you, they'll be like, no, that's who Minda is, or that's who, you know, TK is, that's who Kamal is. And I think once you build that reputation with integrity, then you, you focus on who, who you're riding with versus who isn't and who thinks those things about you. And so for me, it's just, you know, staying authentic and true to what I've started with. That's awesome. So this is my last question. Um, it's based on a tweet that you wrote with, with an exciting announcement. You said, uh, I'm very excited about You Are More Than Magic out in 2022. There are so many tools I needed as a black girl in junior high and high school how to have hard conversations, picking friends, boundaries, how to love yourself when being one of a few and no one wants to date black girls. First of all, congratulations on being able to write this book for a younger audience. Uh, I'm really excited about that. My last question to you is if you could go back in time and travel to Minda as a little girl, what would you say to her? Well, first, thank you. Uh, I would just tell her that, um, Keep being you um, and the things that make you, you, Minda, will serve you when you get to be, um, you know, back then they used to call me little Minda. So when you, <laughs> when you get to become bigger Minda, um, you'll appreciate it so much more, but keep being kind to people, keep being thoughtful and, and keep um, leaning into loving being a, a black girl, even when the people around you don't see and don't love your color. And so um, I, I'm so glad that um, I haven't changed too much from from little Minda. You know, I still have a kind heart. I still am thoughtful, even in a world that would try to um, callous our heart. Right. And I think that those are the, the t this tools, the love that my parents gave me as a child. I can still show that in the workplace today. And so I would just tell her to keep doing what she's doing. Minda, thank you so much for the work that you do. Thank you for the person that you are, um, the spirit of compassion, creativity, and inspiration that you represent. Um, it, it's, it's really been a pleasure and an honor to be able to talk with you. And I hope many people hear your message. If you haven't got the memo, go get your copy today. And you can follow Minda on Twitter at Minda Hearts. And um, it's been an awesome pleasure talking to you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you both so much for sharing your stage with me. All right, everybody, I will see you tomorrow, 12 p.m. Eastern Time on TK's Two Cents Revolution live stream.